here we go again. You want to get good at Rocket League, but you don't want to spend hundreds of hours cracking the game yourself. So today, I'm going to summarize my top 100 lessons learned from thousands of hours coaching players like you, as well as from my time spent playing with some of the best in the world. Regardless of where you're at, I guarantee there will be something in this video for you. Oh my gosh. This is 100 Rocket League mistakes you're probably making and how to fix them. Before the tips, huge thanks to our video sponsor, the Grand Champ Roadmap. The GCR is a private coaching program that I run every six weeks to help players like you reach Grand Champ. Without tips from the coaches and the combined fails of the players, this video wouldn't be possible. So if you just want free general tips, keep watching. But if you're interested to learn more about how over 700 players like you have now fast-tracked their progress, DM me on Discord with the keyword intro, and I'll get a free intro call set up between you and one of my students who's already completed the program, no strings attached. My Discord will be linked in the description below. Otherwise, enjoy the video. Okay, I'm gonna split the 100 mistakes into three sections with timestamps below so you can jump around. Before you go though, first is settings, second is mechanics, and third is game sense. Plus, I'll wrap up with two bonus sections at the end, so stick around for those. Last thing to know, I'm gonna spend a lot of time with more advanced stuff towards the end. So if you're experienced and wanna skip anything, fine, skip the settings, but don't skip mechanics, and especially don't skip game sense at the end, because that stuff will take you all the way up to SSL in terms of difficulty. Let's do it. Mistake number one, using default camera settings, camera shake, or any of that. If you're completely new, check out my settings guides for all this stuff and get it straightened right away. Two, blindly copying a pro's settings. It's fine to set your settings foundation based on a pro's, but everyone is a little different. I recommend checking out Liquipedia because you can view lists of all pro settings and then tinker with some of the popular combos. Copying sensitivity settings. Just like with controller settings, do not just copy pros. What I've learned from experience is that mechanically skilled players can benefit from higher steering and aerial sensitivity, but below GC, consistency is much more important. TLDR, set your steering and aerial sensitivity low to begin with and work them up as you get better. 1.2 to 1.4 is a great place to start for both, but experiment. Four, not binding power slide and joystick air roll to the same button. Power slide only happens on the ground and air roll only happens in the air. Free yourself some space and make recoveries easier by just binding them to the same button. Five, the sooner you bind air roll left or right, the better. Truth is, in the modern state of the game, you're just straight up limited by only using the default joystick air roll. Six, not increasing the size of name tags in game, 150% and up makes it way easier to see when an opponent is challenging and in my opinion it's just straight up better not turning off the unnecessary video settings that limit your fps the more consistent and high your fps the better not sure if this counts but we're gonna call ball cam a setting and a common mistake is keeping ball cam off for too long especially when going for boost this happens in two main ways Case number one is when people turn off ball cam and preemptively decide where they're gonna go. It's totally fine to head back sometimes, but keep your eyes on the play because if something happens, you don't wanna miss it. Second case where people mess up ball cam usage is keeping ball cam on too long when picking up pads. Instead, line yourself up first, get in line with the boost, then toggle ball cam back on and just keep driving straight until you get it. I promise the boost won't move. Number nine, not customizing your quick chats. I actually just started doing this. I don't know how it took me 3K hours to do it, but this is actually a lifesaver. The main ones I recommend you customize are kickoff relevant ones, because for some reason, Sionix doesn't set these in advance. Being able to say on your left and on your right are game changers for solo queue ranked. Also, don't forget the wow keybind for when your teammate throws with 10 seconds left on the clock. Lastly, dead zone settings. These are a bit confusing, so I made a guide on it, but once again, TLDR, I really recommend moving lower on your dead zone as you get better. I've personally lowered mine to 0.04 and I really like it, but most pros use 0.05 and some even 0.10. Try not to go higher than that. 
All right, let's shift gears and talk mechanics. When it comes to mechanics, there are really two camps in Rocket League, and both of them are wrong. On the one hand, you've got your freestylers. These are the people who want to learn high-level mechanics before understanding the basics. Although it's true, I don't want to be that guy in your voice comms who's always saying, you actually don't need mechanics to get better. I got to see one just by being good at dribbling. Let's be real, at this point, everybody knows that high-level Rocket League has mechs, and besides, that guy is boring. Instead, I'm going to give you some things to practice that look sick, but are actually useful too. Number one, shooting and air roll shots. Super relevant in every rank. Number two, air roll plus power slide recoveries. Super slept on. Three, shadow defense and backwards saves. You can't avoid this if you want to get good. Four, fast aerials. So many people do these wrong. I'm going to talk about it later in the video. And five, wall play. These are all super useful stuff that is relevant, but actually looks cool too. So train some of them. Okay, that was a long tip. Like I said, that is one camp. The other camp in Rocket League is going to be your comp sweats. At the same time that little Jimmy is telling you he needs flip resets to get out of diamond, Bill will be trying to tell you he's going to get to SSL without knowing how to aerial. Both are wrong. The fundamentals are important and you also need some high level stuff. Without turning this into an entire mechanics guide, I agree with Flake's summary on this. You can climb very high in the ranked ladder, Bye -bye. GC2, maybe even GC3 with basic mechanics. But truth is, SSL requires speed. No way around it. At some point, you gotta train to improve. 13, power sliding slash drifting. So many players underutilize power slide in their game. And there's this crazy graph that basically shows a direct correlation with your rank and how much you power slide. This is not to say you should hold down power slide, but rather good players use power slide in short bursts but often. Number 14, never delaying your flip when going for shots. If you didn't know, the longer you hold your jump initially, the higher you can get in the air before your second jump expires. So yes, holding your jump button actually extends the amount of time you have for your second dodge. Make sure you're not just tapping jump on power shots or arrow shots. 15, not using your second jump if you get bumped or falling off the ceiling. Number 16, same thing off the wall. This is a little more situational and advanced, but I think it is useful to know that you can get grounded quicker by turning your car upside down and neutral jumping off the wall. Number 17, not using power slide for recoveries and controlling speed. Many people know that if you get bumped, you should power slide. But what you probably haven't thought about is that if you are landing and your car is not facing the exact direction your velocity vectors are facing, there will be some amount of momentum loss on your contact with the ground if you don't hold power slide. What this means is that whenever you are landing or you get bumped or knocked around, you want it to be muscle memory to instantly grab your drift button. And you can always adjust or correct with a half flip. Speaking of, number 18, neglecting half flips. The amount of people who ignore half flips, even up to champ and GC, is just heinous. So many people think wave dashes are more important than half flips, but they're not. You need both. Number 19, half flipping the wrong way or just not knowing all the ways to half flip. If you didn't know, there are two ways to half flip. Once again, I have a tutorial on this. A long story short, you can half flip using a flip cancel plus directional air roll or just a diagonal flip cancel if you time it right. Also, depending on where you point your joystick during your first dodge, you can even turn a half flip into what I've dubbed a quarter flip because I think that describes it well. 20, not making contact with the nose of your car for maximum power on your shots. Reason being is because the more straight you can connect with the ball, the more force transfer you'll get. Verge calls this straight line mass. I call it common sense, but whatever works for you, <laughs> hit it with your nose, not your roof, and obviously not your wheels. 21, shooting using front flips only. This might sound counterintuitive to my last tip, but I promise it's not. For example, if you're attacking the ball from an angle, you can sometimes get more force transfer and more vertical power using diagonal flips or even sideways flips slash barrel rolls in certain cases. Generally, the greater the angle you're attacking on, the more you should lean towards a barrel roll. But even straight on shots can benefit from a diagonal flip for a little bit of misdirection. 22, using air roll excessively. It's good to learn new tricks and practice air roll. I think this is a super key mechanic, but a common newbie mistake is that so many people use air roll in a way that actually messes up their trajectory when they were already in line to hit the ball. Yes, pros constantly use air roll, but last I checked, you're not a pro. For now, let's just 
just focus on hitting the ball consistently. 23, not boosting through your shots. This is mostly a mental block, I think, with most players, but unpopular opinion warning, I think it's better to get a fast shot with poor placement than a weak shot with poor placement. Now, of course, situations vary, but over the long term, you got to learn how to shoot fast anyways. So I think it's best to just try to hit the ball as hard as you can when you're shooting. Number 24, learning both directional air rolls. Yes, I think learning both directional air rolls is a mistake. If you know me, you know I've been saying this since 2020. If you wanna be competitive, you do need one directional air roll. Two air rolls is very much optional, but to be clear, yes, one is mandatory. Number 25, not pulling back your joystick before starting your fast aerial. So I wanna set the record straight, hopefully for the last time, probably not, but a double jump is not a fast aerial. Double jump aerials miss out on two key parts. Number one, they don't max out the height of your first jump, which is not good. And number two, they take longer to get your boost working in the vertical plane. A true fast aerial is different because one, it maxes out the height of the first jump. And number two, a proper fast aerial tilts back instantly while holding down on that first jump to get your boost working in the vertical plane as quick as possible. Number 26, air dribbling mistakes. Of course, there are many of these, but the number one culprit, from what I've seen, is focusing on distance instead of height. Oftentimes, new air dribblers get so locked in on just scoring an air dribble, they don't realize it probably never would have gone in with proper defense. So yes, I think it's more useful to practice air dribbling the ball into the ceiling than into the goal as a training exercise, of course. And you'll actually learn way faster that way than trying to just push the ball into the net off the wall. That's not really an air dribble. Number 27, smushing your double taps. This one's pretty simple. It just comes down to not creating space between you and the ball on double taps. The more space you can create, the wider room for error and the easier it is to actually get the ball on net. 28, using fancy mechanics too soon in game. I think Waiten had a really great take on this that is a especially relevant in 1v1. I might be butchering it, but this is kind of what he said. You want to think of your mechanics in two categories based on what they do. On the one hand, you have your sort of opener moves that don't really commit you and are generally safer. And then you have your finishing moves. These are the fancy ones that are generally cooler, but are a bit risky. Once you understand that, the idea is you want to make sure you're using your finishing moves only as finishing moves, not as openers. Why? It's very high risk if it doesn't work. The odds they save it is pretty high. And if things don't go well, you're gonna leave your teammate stranded in a 2v1. Instead, use those openers to gain an advantage and then use your favorite mechanic as the finisher when the risk is lower, the defense is a little bit worn down and you can recover even if you fail. I might've gotten more into the game sense theoretical part. So we'll talk about that more later too, but I do think that's useful to think about. Back to the scheduled program. Number 29, it's a bird. It's a plane. Nope, it's just a diamond. Generally, the lower ranks, especially plat, champ, diamond, overestimate aerial play and underestimate what you can do on the ground. Just because the ball's in the air doesn't mean you have to go fly to hit it. Once again, we'll talk more about this later. 30, supersonic boost. If you're going supersonic, you should stop boosting. At that point, you're just wasting boost. Believe it or not, you can just hold drive to maintain supersonic. 31, wall shots. So especially if you're lower ranked, listen up. The first thing you should do off the wall when going for an off the wall shot is air roll to get your car flat. The reason wall shots are so complicated is because you have to start in this really unnatural sideways position that you rarely see on the ground. So if you can air roll to get your car flat back to that sort of neutral position, it'll help you a lot with getting your bearings. You don't have to do this. I just think it's useful. Kickoffs. Uh-oh. Wave dashing on kickoffs. There's no reason to do this unless you can't diagonal flip. Even so, flip on your kickoffs. Kickoff mistake number two, front flipping into the 50-50. This isn't a mistake. It's just not optimal per se. Better is to diagonal flip or barrel roll on that 50-50 to actually control the ball, push it, and follow towards the side you want. Number 34, I got hiccups. Oh, this is a marathon, man. We're gonna take intermission. <sighs> They were fine. <coughs> <coughs> I just hiccuped. I just I just got him back. Been an hour since I recorded and I just coughed and got the hiccups.
Oh my, I'm so angry. I'm so upset. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. It's been like two hours. I still have hiccups. I'm just gonna record anyways. All right, let's do it. Number 34, using all your boost. This is a pretty obvious kickoff mistake, but you don't need all the boost to get to the kickoff. Just save a little bit if possible. Number 35, diagonal flipping or speed flipping the wrong way on kickoffs. I'll go over the easiest ways and how I do it from every kickoff spawn, but just so you know, these are not the only ways. On corner spawns, I recommend turning upfield, then speed flipping infield for your kickoffs. On the slightly off center spawns in the back, turn infield then speed flip upfield and on dead center spawns you can turn either way and just speed flip in the opposite direction forwards to stay in line with the ball finally i'm not sure if boost counts as a mechanic but there are a lot of mistakes here so i'm just gonna list out a couple not picking up small pads burning boost for no reason especially the top half of your tank boosting then hitting the brakes this is just silly. Don't boost if you're gonna hit the brakes in a second. And honestly, I could go on and on with mistakes. With boost, it's not really a matter of if you're misusing it, it's how much you're misusing it. So watch your replays for this stuff. All right, wrapping up mechanics and now moving on to game sense. Before we jump into game sense though, I just want to make a warning. I'm going to try my best with this game sense stuff to explain every common situation and mistake I see with as much detail as possible. But at the end of the day, I want you to understand that no matter what it is, every rule I go over is wrong. The only catch between a good rule and a bad rule is how often it's useful. Long story short, every situation varies. Every rule is wrong, but some are still useful. Number 37, corner jamming. I'm going to talk a lot about corner situations because I think they're some of the trickiest to understand in Rocket League. But at base level, I need you to understand a controversial idea about the corners I hold that I think is pretty useful. In my opinion, your corner is the safest place to have a controlled ball. Conversely, the opposing corner is the worst place to have a controlled ball. Or maybe even better, taking a 50-50 in the opponent's corner is most dangerous, while taking a controlled 50-50 in your your corner is usually the safest. If you don't believe me, keep watching. Number 38, hitting the ball with no purpose. This is Rocket League, not volleyball or ping pong. You really, really don't want to throw possession if you don't have to. An important catch, I will say that below champ, sometimes you can get away with just banging the ball over your opponent's head and letting them mess up. But at some point, you gotta learn how to control possession if you really want to get better and rank up. Number 39, equal and opposite to hitting the ball with no purpose is always challenging. So many low ranked players make this mistake. So to be clear, if a ball is not in a threatening position and the opponent attacks the ball in a way that doesn't threaten anything, it is perfectly fine to just let him hit it. If there's no threat, don't go. Simple as that. Ooh, number 40. This one's good. This is something I call single versus double versus triple outplays. The basic idea here is that there are certain mechanics that are generally better for outplaying a single defender versus two defenders defenders versus even three defenders. Let's consider a flick versus a ground to air dribble just as an example. In a ground to air dribble, if you outplay one defender at the start, so long as you still have boost, you can continue the air dribble to outplay a second or even third defender at the end. There's outplay potential even after you beat the first man. However, when it comes to a flick, once you launch that ball, it's out of your control. Why is this relevant? Well, it explains why tons of players go for flicks in 1v1 and you'll see pros air dribbling the the ball all the time in 3v3. The problem is not that flicks are bad. Flicks are a great mechanic. They just naturally aren't great at beating two defenders, at least two good ones. So if you get the ball and it's just a one-on-one, -on -one, go for flicks, go for air dribbles. You can really do whatever you want. But if it's say a 2v1 or a 3v1, you really want to focus on power shots, power slide cuts, direction changes, fakes, and other outplays that have potential to beat two defenders, or at the very least beat the first without full committing you afterwards. That was a little long, but I think it's worth it. Mistake number 41. And the mistake is going for carries and flicks every time. I know I just mentioned it as an example in my previous 
best tip, but I think it's worth a tip of its own. From what I've seen coaching people, I think this is just a symptom of not being comfortable with bounce dribbles and not really knowing how to attack properly. But going for a carry every time you get the ball is so, 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 so bad. Not only is it hard to outplay two defenders with a carry and a flick, but carries are also really tricky in that they take time to set up. You have to control the ball the entire time using boost. And if an opponent is already pushed up when you try to start the carry, they're just going to early challenge and dunk you every time. Moral of the story, if you want to outplay monkeys, you have to create angles and stay behind the ball, not under it, and punish the idiot when he early challenges you. Tip number 42, making your first touch in a straight line down the center of the field. Here's why. The goal of Rocket League is not to get the ball towards your opponent's net. It's to get the ball in their net. And this confuses a lot of people. What matters more than getting it close to the opponent's net is actually outplaying the defenders that are guarding it. You might be like, oh, no shit, Sherlock. But then why are you hitting the ball in a straight line right at them every time you get it? If you can, you want to make your first touch on an angle away from the opponents, ideally across the field if you have space. This does three things. One, it creates angles for outplays. Two, it gives you better vision of the opponents for when they challenge. And three, it also gives you more time to develop the play. Mistake number 43, rotating back without looking for opportunities. This is kind of a general mistake. So to make this actionable, I wanna give you two things that I look at whenever I'm rotating. First thing I check for is opponents moving through the middle of the field. If you're rotating and you see an opponent somewhere near your path and they're sitting duck, you should always, always, always demo them. It'll cause chaos for the opponent's rotation and as long as it doesn't cost you much, it's usually a net positive. The second thing I'll check for is unattended big boosts. Whoever controls the corner boost controls the game. And if there are uncollected big boosts sitting in your opponent's corner, just denying it for the sake of denying it can net your team a lot of initiative, maintain pressure, or if you're on your own side of the field, get you off of defense. Number 44, shooting from midfield. If there's space to, you should always get closer to the net. You might not be used to catching the ball and getting a controlled first touch, but this is something you should learn regardless. Not using your right joystick or camera pitch at all, especially in the corners. This comes into play when you're defending from your net in your corner and the ball is maybe bouncing off the wall towards center. Because if you have ball cam on in this situation and you're facing the side of the field, you won't be able to see your opponents attacking from upfield. This is when it becomes super Super important to use your joystick to check upfield. Number 46, taking the ball from your teammate. There's the obvious version of this where it's like, yeah, don't take the ball from your teammate while they're mid dribble. But the less obvious version of this that I want to highlight for you higher ranked players is when both you and your teammate could go for a ball, but your teammate honestly has the better angle. It might be better to just turn off the ball, rotate around, let your teammate take it, and get behind him for a more efficient rotation. Number 47, hitting the ball too hard and giving up possession. A specific situation I want to highlight is at the end of defensive sequences. This is super common, even at the higher ranks. I'll watch somebody who's been defending for a while. They're really anxious. The opponents finally let off some pressure, and unfortunately, our player booms the ball right back to midfield where they're waiting. If the opponents aren't challenging, it's always better to just control the ball, take it to your corner boost if you need to get boost. Whatever you do, just don't give possession back to them. Mistake number 48, not dribbling on angles. You might be like, Luke, didn't you mention this three tips ago? And yes, sometimes we need to be reminded more than we need to be taught. So since it's been three tips, don't forget to keep making your first touch on an angle, not towards your opponents every time. Number 49, trying to force goals as first man. If you, as the person with the ball, go for some miraculous air dribble, fail, give up the ball, and then your teammate concedes the 1v1, moving back to your side of the field, it's not your teammate's fault for conceding the 1v1. It's absolutely yours for tossing the ball and putting him there. If you're ever playing first man and you've got the ball in the opposing corner, if you start to notice that the chance of converting is going to be slim, opt for non-committal centers, and more generally, try not to full commit in the opponent's corner if there isn't a clear payoff to doing so. Mistake number 50, committing instead of shadowing. This is really good and builds off the previous tip. So let's flip the script. Let's say you're second man at midfield and your teammate, of course, tosses ball. Now you're in a 2v1. In these situations, you almost always want to fake challenge into shadowing. You can only really afford to commit if you can 99% beat the opponent to the ball cleanly. 
Number 51, single jump defense. A common mistake players make while shadowing in these 1v1 or even 2v1 situations is trying to stop the opponent's dribble at midfield. It can be done, but contesting a dribble at midfield, especially if the opponent has backup, is risky. This is why when I'm shadowing, my primary goal is either A, get them to toss the ball, or B, get them to toss it into my corner. So number 52, going for a mechanically demanding shot over a basic shot. All else equal, take the shot, you can hit more consistently. Number 53, going for a committal mechanic over a non-committal mech. Here's a classic example. Let's say you're given the ball at midfield and the opposing defender is in their net. Should you go for a bounce dribble or a flick? Most people would say flick and most people suck. <laughs> That's a little harsh. The reason you should go for a bounce dribble is because a bounce dribble will not commit you as much as, say, a flick. So if your scoring chance is equal, go for the thing that will keep you back and ready to follow up the play, as opposed to the one that you have to scramble to recover from. Number 54, playing for a pass from your solo queue teammate. Especially in 2v2, just stop playing to the side of your teammate. I promise, little Jimmy does not even see the opponents, much less you, his teammate, so get behind him. Number 55, if you do get a pass, don't always shoot it right away. When I see people get passes, so many are just so flustered by the fact that they actually got a pass that they think they have to shoot it. Remember though, the closer to the net, the more likely you are to convert, but just remember that you can use the pass to make a soft touch, then a follow-up touch into your shot. Number 56, getting baited by a center ball. Just just because the ball is centered doesn't mean you have to go for it. Only go for passes that are clean, free, safe. Number 57, pre-jumping constantly. This is crazy common, so don't let your ego get in the way and think this isn't you. Trust me, I still do this mistake. I guarantee you do too. So many people jump for aerials way sooner than they have to. This is a problem because look, even if you're gonna commit for a ball, staying grounded is better because you move quicker on the ground, you don't have to commit, and you're more boost efficient. So even if you are gonna take the shot, chill out. You don't need to jump at mid field to get to it. Number 58, rushing and not lining up your shots before you jump. Generally, you have way more time than you think you do. So don't rush your shot and commit to a bad line when you don't have to. Number 59, hesitating and getting caught midfield or just out of position. If you're debating a challenge as the last man in twos or threes, here's my rule. If it's right in front of your net, challenge it. If it's midfield and you're debating whether or not to go for it, don't. You only want to challenge if a shot is truly threatening. Once again, I only recommend challenging as last man when it's a 100% I'm gonna beat them type of situation. If those things aren't true, fake challenge and shadow. Number 60, flipping into every ball. Generally, you gotta think, if I do win this challenge, do I wanna send the ball flying upfield or would I rather it be more of a dead 50-50 that I can follow up afterward? Obviously, use a flip to correct your 50-50 if you're just completely not in line to hit the ball. But more often than you may think, it may be better to play for a weak 50 that gives you possession afterwards than one that will send the ball flying upfield maybe to their second man. Also, you'll become grounded quicker without using the flip, but just food for thought. 61, going for slow versus fast passes. Generally, I believe that at the lower ranks, it's better to go for a slow lob pass, maybe way up in the air off the top of their backboard than a bullet pass right at your teammate. Why? One, little Jimmy's more likely to connect with it if it's slower. And number two, if your pass is a lob in the air, you can get back in case your teammate misses it versus a bullet pass where your teammate might whiff and you don't even have time to get back. Number 62, slamming the ball right off the side wall. Sometimes this is okay, but most of the time, if you are going to do a self pass off the sidewall, you want it to be slightly angled upfield. This is because it's harder for an opponent to read when your hit is slightly angled forward and because a hit directly off the wall doesn't give you much time to react or a very good angle to hit it. Self passes are fine, but try to make them upfield. Number 63, pushing up too far a second man. A good rule of thumb is wherever you think you need to be, you probably want to be five to 10 car lengths behind that. Genuinely, just stay at midfield as second man. You're only playing for clean, free, safe centers anyway, so being upfield is usually just an easy way to get the ball knocked over your head. Also, if you're low ranked, it's just easier to get a ball that's in front of you, so just keep most of the field in front of you. Mistake number 64, taking the center and back boost pads as the person following up the kickoff. Please leave the side boost for your teammate. And exceptions do occur, but really don't take both boost pads. Number 65, 
55, staying on the ball after you just 50 50 it during a kickoff. After a kickoff, the person cheating is the one coming from behind. They have more boost. They have a better angle. They probably have momentum. So generally let them take it. Number 66, let's say you go for a kickoff and you unintentionally lose it to one of your corners and your teammate's not there. If this inadvertently happens, just make sure you rotate back and pick up small pads. Don't be the guy taking boost upfield while your teammate defends one-on-ones. You want to be covering your teammates back whenever a 50-50 happens. Number 67, don't get attached to any one play, any one attack, any one pass, anything. I've seen so many players who are clearly beat to a ball and they know it too. Still jump up for some sort of like Hail Mary dunk. Moral of the story, if you're beat, don't go for the Hail Mary dunks, especially in their corner. Just don't, don't do it. Number 68, aerialing from the ground when the ball's near the wall. If the ball's near the wall, use the wall to climb without using boost because it'll save you boost and you'll go faster. Number 69, flipping around the field. My mindset on this really shifted when I was doing a coaching session with Rapid and he literally pulled up a first killer replay and we watched for like 30 seconds while first killer was driving around the field, literally never flipping. Flipping actually commits you. It locks your car up during that whole animation. And in a fast paced game with a lot of collisions, it's really bad to be stuck flipping when the ball changes direction. Focus on just flipping to cover long distances. Otherwise, save it. You're gonna be better served if you're just always ready when random stuff happens. Number 70, saving the ball to your corner every time. This can actually be a mistake if it means that the ball bounces off the corner and goes back to your opponent at midfield. You wanna save the ball away from the center of your net, usually, right? You don't wanna pass it, but it's also important to save it to your corner soft. That way the opponents don't immediately get the ball back or even if they do they don't have much space with it 71 stop playing perma goalie especially when the opponent has space and you need to shadow this happens a lot at the lower ranks and actually one of the common mistakes on top of mistakes is rotating back post instead of shadowing rotating back post is not just a substitute for shadowing most times a one-on-one -on -one needs to be met with a shadow otherwise you're making it too easy for the opponent to get away with mistakes as they dribble the ball across the field and you make it too hard for you to save the ball because you're attacking opposite the way the ball's moving which just shortens your working reaction time Number 72, rotating through the middle of the net and calling it back post. At the low ranks, I don't know why. I think it's because the straight boost path, like in the middle of the field is well straight, but for whatever reason, low rank players love to rotate through the middle of the net. Get used to rotating back post. It's more boost efficient. And really you gotta keep the net and the backboard in front of your car. Number 73, stop relying on the middle boost pads. There are two long hooks, as I call them, that run up and down the field that actually provide more boost and provide more natural rotations if you have time. Learn them and try to use them. Number 74, sticking to only rotate back post as a be all end all rotation strategy. Once again, there are times you need to shadow and even more rare are the times you should go front post instead of back post. Once again, these are not common, but I do want to mention that they do exist. So back post and shadow are your rules, front post the exception. A useful tip here is don't shadow when you have no boost. Like if you have to, sometimes you'll just have to go back to your corner and get boost then drive back up and try to close the gap with shadowing. I feel like that goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyways. Number 75, not using the rainbow pads in front of your net. This rainbow pad or short hook boost lane is absolutely critical to surviving long defensive sequences, especially when you're getting boost star. Do not hit me with the, I need boost quick chat if all these boosts are left uncollected. 76, being scared slash avoiding your backboard. On defense, I noticed that a lot of people will try to fly up and hit a ball before it hits their backboard. This can be useful if the read is super bad, but it's also important to remember that you can use a backboard bounce too. This actually happens more than you think, and you're probably not using your backboard for your own bounces enough. Number 77, neglecting the backboard on saves. Especially when countering a high level aerial play, having one on the backboard and one in net is absolutely essential. I mean, it's tough. One of them just needs to double jump or something, dude. Spit on my mom. Do something, dude. Not only does the backboard save boost, but it's a great way to save more mechanical aerial attacks. This is more important the higher rank you get, but a good rule of thumb is you just want to look at your teammate 
and cover whatever they're not covering. 78, not controlling your boost and dodging demo while shadowing. This is kind of a two for one tip, but as you shadow and as you hopefully force the ball into your corner as last man, it's really important that you collect all your big pads along the way and that you avoid demo. To grab boost, just don't miss the boost. And to dodge demos, I actually have a strategy for this. If an opponent's attacking you, trying to get your car facing 90 degrees to theirs, and then once they get close to you, you hit the brakes. If you do this right, they should go flying by the front of your car. 79, not using fake challenges. Basically, don't be predictable. You gotta throw in fake challenges as well as real ones to keep your opponents guessing. However, to put this in perspective and to hopefully make it a little bit concrete, when I'm in 2v2 and ones actually, my goal is to fake challenge more often than I real challenge. So if you're not even at 50% real challenge to fake challenge ratio, you gotta fake challenge more. Number 80, too many power clears. I'll leave this by saying power clears are definitely useful when you're on defense, but they definitely shouldn't be your go-to. Unless you need to alleviate pressure or you're taking advantage of an opponent who's overextended, aim for controlled touches and maintaining possession in order to create a better breakaway. Number 81, letting go of pressure. Rotating all the way back to net or your corner boost while your team is attacking can be really, really costly. Where's the other blue guy? Where's our blue friend? Hello there. Oh my lord, Crypto, what are you doing, man? Ball's coming center. Come on. Don't don't be like Crypto. Don't don't come on come on, man. Even even if you like don't have boost, you like Anyways, instead, use this middle hook path as you rotate back. Of course, checking for demos, checking for big boosts like we talked about. And if you need to go back, fine, but follow the path first. Number 82, cutting rotation. Cutting rotation is usually just not worth it below Grand Champ. Even if it's good for you, it'll probably mess up your teammates. So generally, stick to the program, hit the ball, rotate off it. First man, second man, third man, don't cut rotations. Number 83, consistently missing boosts on rotations. I'm not just gonna say missing boosts, boost is the culprit. I think this actually happens for two more core reasons. Number one, I think people flip too much while they rotate. If you're always flipping while you're rotating, you can't zigzag and pick up boost effectively. Number two, a lot of people just don't know boost lights. Recall some of the ones I told you earlier and spend some time in free play actually picking up boost. Number 84, following the ball versus following your teammates when you rotate. Please don't just speed around the field always following the ball or you're always gonna be one step behind the play. Look at where your teammates are and cover what's uncovered. So if your teammate's chasing, yes, you gotta respect it and play back. Number 85, not timing rotations. At any given time, you've gotta look at the play and think, how quick is the ball moving? What might happen in this 50-50? And more generally, how quick do I need to be there? Even if you know you should get back post, based on how quick the play is advancing, that's gonna determine the actual route you should take. The slower the play, the wider the rotation, the more boost you pick up, and the faster, the quicker you gotta be there. This is all about maximizing your efficiency and your time spent off the ball. Number 86, if all else fails, you're feeling overwhelmed and you just don't know what to do, I recommend just make it your backup plan to always rotate off the ball back towards your side of the field to cover your net. Yeah, it's not perfect, but the minute you catch yourself losing track of what you're doing, wide rotation out, reassess the play, get behind the ball. Usually you can figure things out from there. Number 86, hesitation. Everybody knows hesitation's bad and I don't really have a way to solve it other than reps. But if you're somebody who just likes to think in terms of rules, here's a rule that I think is useful based on game mode. If you're in ranked threes and you're having a hesitation moment, I say, just go. If it's 2v2 or 1v1, that's when I say don't go. Is the system perfect or scientific? Absolutely not. Will it help? Maybe. This is just based on my experience with the game modes. Give it a shot. Number 88, playing significantly more than you train. If you want to progress your mechanics in equal parts to your game sense, train as much as you play. And if you want to get better faster, just watch more of my vids. Number 89, neglecting warmups. Just hopping into free play for five to 10 minutes before a rank session can have a huge difference. So warm up a little bit before you play. Number 90, neglecting the fundamentals. Yeah, yeah, I said I wouldn't be that guy, but I will say, I think it's totally normal to train the fun stuff more than the not so fun stuff. So what I try to do is whenever I am gonna train something that I know is not optimal, my process is first, I have to train a fundamental, shooting, aerials, whatever 
I be. And then once I do that for even just a little bit, I can go train whatever I want. Number 91, neglecting the new shortcuts. I think it was a few months ago, Rocket League added some of the base level Bacchus mod D-pad shortcuts, even for console players. If you haven't seen my video on that, check it out. You can use those to accelerate your training. Number 92, this one's for those of you on PC and it's not using workshop maps or plugins. Workshop maps are by far one of the best ways to improve, but plugins are sneakily becoming a really good way too. One special plugin I want to highlight is called the Free Play Checkpoint plugin. This thing is actually cracked at making you cracked, especially for aerial mechanics. So check out my video on it too. Number 93, not learning from the correct resources. In other words, I think it's possible to get bad habits by watching pros. Of course, usually I don't think that's the case, but I say this just to say you shouldn't always copy the pros. The problem is pros do things for reasons you probably don't understand. And even if you do understand, understand what they're doing, you may not understand or see the other things they're doing that enable them to get away with what they were doing in the first place. The take home lesson here is that I think it's best to learn from people that are just a little bit ahead of you and not leagues ahead of you. Number 94, training routines. This is for the more devoted, but I do think it's a mistake to always do the same thing every time you play Rocket League, no matter what it is. I say it's good to keep changing the way you train, at least your training volume for different mechanics, because you want to become more versatile and train different things as you get better. Don't have the same routine for a full 30 days. Two to three weeks max is good. Bar, maybe air roll. Directional air roll might take more than a month, but that's like the only thing I can think of. And this is separate from a warm-up routine. Everyone should have a warm-up routine, no matter what you're training. Everybody's training routine may vary. Number 95, don't go into ranked if you're having a bad day or you're in a bad mood or you're playing bad, don't do it. There's nobody's holding the gun to your head. We all have on and off days, don't force it. Number 96, Rocket League is a game of physics, not luck. Yes, some things are hard to predict, but generally stop blaming the game. Take ownership of all your outcomes, even ones that your team played a part in. It is literally impossible for your teammate to be 100% the reason you got scored on. There's always something that you could have changed to prevent the Focus on yourself. Number 97, stop solo queuing as much as you can. Queuing with somebody on comms is the easiest way to rank up faster without changing anything else. Number 98, stop getting obsessed with rank and start playing for improvement. The people who obsess over their rank are the ones who burn out and get stuck there forever. And the ones who are just trying to improve are actually the ones that reach SSL. Number 99, tilt queuing. You've got to know when to get off the game. And seriously, don't overestimate yourself here. Your ego will tell you, tilted? I'm not getting tilted, but you are because you're telling yourself that. <laughs> so no one to call it quits and please don't tilt Q and tank your rank. Number 100, don't be the guy that initiates the forfeit. Just don't be that guy. If you need to forfeit, let your teammate ask for it. Don't be the guy that starts it. There's no reason to. And finally, mistake 101 is watching this entire video and not sharing it with your Jimmy teammate. Share this video with one of your Jimmy friends who needs it so you can both get out of champ too. This took a lot of work, shout out to everybody involved, but most importantly, you watching, thank you so much. The fact that you would sit here and listen to me go over all this is just so cool to me. So seriously, thank you. I hope this was helpful and I'll catch you all in the next one. Peace guys.